Welcome. Today we're going to talk about k-means clustering as well as mixture models. These are two canonical examples of what is known as unsupervised learning. So up until this point we've been talking about what is known as supervised learning. Supervised learning differs from unsupervised learning in the sense that supervised learning generally has uh, labels for the points. For unsupervised learning, the points are going to be unlabeled. We're just going to have feature vectors. And the idea is, given only the feature vectors, you have to learn something about the structure of the data. And one of the canonical tasks in this uh, setting is what is known as clustering. To give you a kind of a picture of what clustering looks like, suppose you had a data set which looks something like some points over here, and maybe some points over here. The idea of clustering is naturally, as you might guess, to sort of cluster these points. That is, in this case, given these two, uh, two, given one set of points, but which kind of look like two sets of points like this, then the idea is that you want to find and identify this set of points as one cluster, and maybe this set of points as another cluster. Uh, crucially, as opposed to previous pictures I've uh, drawn for you, in previous pictures I had maybe points labeled as uh, some are positive, some are, minus, uh, are negative, but here in this picture you'll note that they're all just black. There's nothing sort of distinguishing any of these points from the other in terms of their label. It's just the fact that these points are close to each other and these points in, in inter... Uh, I'll get inter and intra confused. So let me just say that these points are all kind of close to each other, but if you take a point from this cluster and this cluster, then uh, they uh, are far from each other. So intuitively matching what you're... Uh, guess about what clustering should be, you can tell that this is the right answer. But of course, that's not really good enough to just say, oh, you just kind of group points together that look similar. Uh, let's try to be a bit more precise about what a clustering problem is. So a clustering problem is roughly, it can be sort of described as the following. We are given, say, a data set x, which is equal to x1 through xn, so n points. And the goal is to partition into, say, clusters, C1 through Ck. Uh, what, do I, what do we mean by partition? A partition of a set means we just uh, separate it into a bunch of, uh, we group these uh, data points into a bunch of different sets, such that uh, every point is contained in at least one set, and uh, no point is contained in two different sets. So just to give you a very basic example, you could imagine if we have n equals 5 and k equals 3, we could have, say, c1 equal to x1, x5, c2 is equal to x2, and c3 is equal to x3, x4. This is an example of a partition, Not, nothing too sophisticated here. But okay, uh, we want to partition them. And the goals, very informally, the goals in terms of this partition that we're going to want are that points within a cluster are similar. And this is, again, informal, so uh, we're not really going to say yet what similar means. And then points in different clusters are different or dissimilar. And again, this is all like, these are a bit informal, but uh, we'll formalize it in a sec. But the main idea is that maybe this matches your intuition that points in, these cluster, in this cluster are similar to each other, points in this cluster are similar to each other, but points within, between two different clusters, they're kind of different because they're very far from each other. Uh, okay, one thing I will comment about this uh, definition is, or about this type of goal is one thing that you need is you need to know it, there's a hyperparameter here, k. So maybe beforehand you don't know what the right value of k is, how many clusters there might be. For example, uh, if we have something like this, then sort of 2 seems like the right answer. 
but how do we know that a priori? We don't necessarily. So, but for for the sake of today's presentation, we're going to just assume that uh, the value, the right value of k that we want to go with, is kind of known, just so that we can draw right nice pictures. I guess technically speaking, nothing will really uh, change. You can always run these algorithms with the wrong value of k, but uh, knowing the value of k will have some advantages in terms of uh, yeah, in terms of uh, getting good answers. Okay, so intuitively we see what clustering is. Uh, we're trying to just group the points such that every point points within a cluster are somehow similar. And let's try to be a bit more uh, precise about what we're trying to do. So what we're going to try to do is we're going to try to minimize. We're going to do a minimization over all partitions uh, C1 through CK. So all the ways of grouping these points into K sets, C1 through CK. And what we're trying to optimize is the following function, which we're going to leave a little bit abstract for now. We are going to optimize this. So some, uh, what, what these terms here represent is this is some cost function for points in cluster J. So the idea is that we have to pay something for where some function of the points which fall into the set, and then we sum that over all sets in our partition, or all clusters in our partition. Okay, so this is abstract as it is. Uh, let me try to tell you what specific uh, function W that we're going to look at. And the specific function we're going to look at will result in a problem known as k-means. Uh, and it's kind of intuitive why that's the name. The idea is that there's going to be k, k is the hyperparameter. And the idea is we're going to try to uh, optimize the mean, optimize distance to the mean of each of these uh, clusters. So to be uh, more precise, we're going to say that, like, let me just write this here. W of CJ is equal to size of CJ, normalization factor, summation of XI, XJ, or XI, XI prime, let's say, which are in CJ. Uh, and we take the sum of the L2 distances squared between the pairs. So yeah, uh, the way to do this is the way to see this is you take the sum of the squared L2 distances between each point, each pair of points which lie within the cluster, and you sum up those uh, squared L2 distances and average them. And then you sum that over all clusters and that gives you the total cost. Now you might be wondering why this is called k-means. Well, there's another way to uh, write this, which is a bit simpler. Um, well, at least I consider it to be a bit simpler. This is equivalent. I'm not going to do the calculation for you, but it can also be written as the following. Yeah, this is a bit closer than this might be more apparent why it's called uh, k-means. So the idea is for each cluster, what you do is you compute the mean of that cluster. That is the average of the points in there, or it's sometimes called a centroid, also called a centroid. So you compute the centroid of the points which lie in that cluster. And then for each point in that cluster, you take the distance to that uh, centroid and you take the L2 distance and you square it. And then you sum that over all points in the cluster maybe a factor of two, it doesn't matter too much. And you just minimize the sum over all, uh, summed over all uh, clusters in your partition. And that's the k-means uh, objective function. Uh, let me note that there's like many, the, the, there's many tweaks. This is only a single function w, but it's a, the, perhaps the most common one. Uh, you can change it up and get sort of different optimization uh, problems. 
For example, another thing you could do is if you don't have the squared, it's just the sum of the L2 distances, that gives rise to another optimization problem known as uh, K medians, uh, because uh, this is the geometric median, the point which minimizes this. But uh, we'll just stick with the uh, K means for today's lecture for simplicity and because it's the most common. Uh, and so, yeah, intuitively, maybe you see that this kind of matches up with the picture of uh, what we have here in the sense that what, what are we trying to do? We're trying to uh, group points such that the kind of sum of squared distances to the mean is small. Well, the natural way to do this is just by doing exactly these two clusters that we have here. The means of these two clusters will be something like, I don't know, maybe around here and maybe around here. And you can see that uh, assigning these points which lie within this oval here to be in this cluster corresponding to this, that uh, that would be the best thing. And in particular, if we say included just one point from the other cluster, something like this, well, that would be no good because remember, the, you're looking at the average distance to the uh, mean. So this would add a lot of distance onto it and maybe it would drag the mean over here. And then you would also pay a lot of distance here. So somehow, I recommend you play around with this a bit, but really try to justify to yourself that uh, this kind of uh, objective function indeed corresponds to types of pictures like this in very simple, in, in simple cases like this at least. Okay, so that's the objective function. Um, now, how do we optimize this objective function? Well, there's many different ways we could optimize this objective function. Uh, one way we could optimize this objective function would be to simply, uh, what do I want to say? Here's a slow algorithm. Uh, we simply try all partitions. So that is we split, we, we, since we want to minimize overall partition C1 through CK, we just try all of them. And then for each partition, we compute the uh, loss function. Uh, the reason why this is uh, bad is because of the fact that uh, there's really uh, roughly K to the N uh, partitions. So that's going to take a very long time. So it's not something we would really do unless K is very small and N is very small as well. Now, another thing you might be thinking is, okay, I mean, we do gradient descent all the time. Why not just run gradient descent on this? Well, the reason that doesn't really work is because we kind of have these hard memberships in the sense that when you're computing this mean, uh, it's really dependent on uh, which, which cluster something belongs to. So it kind of has zero one identity in terms of which it belongs to. So yeah, that's not, it's generally not going to work uh, for things like that. So more broadly speaking, uh, I'm pretty sure, yeah, I'm pretty sure this is a non-convex problem in particular. So yeah, that type of thing is not going to work. Um, instead, what we're going to do, what the common solution to this type of algorithm is something known as Lloyd's algorithm. And it's a very simple algorithm, which is, which is pretty neat and uh, yeah, is, is kind of easy to describe. Uh, yeah. And it's actually going to be a warm up because uh, for the next part of this lecture, when we talk about uh, mixture models, the mixture model algorithm is going to be kind of like a much harder version, not much harder, I think it's not that bad, uh, to be honest, but it's a more challenging version than this, which is kind of a very intuitive idea. And the algorithm is as follows. The idea is we're going to first start by initialize some partition. We start with C1 through CK. The question you might ask is how do we initialize a partition? Well, we can do this anyway, just split the points randomly, or maybe we can do something more intelligent sometimes. And I'll, toward the end of this part, I'll talk about a more intel, I'll mention that there is a more intelligent way to do it, which uh, the initialization can have a big effect. But anyway, that's like uh, kind of the less interesting part of the algorithm. Um, the main idea behind the algorithm is the following two steps. What we do is for each cluster, since we've defined the partitions, 
So for each cluster CJ, compute a centroid that is we just uh, let mu sub j be equal to the average of the points which lie within that cluster so that's the centroid and the next step that we do is uh, for each point then we assign it to the cluster with the nearest centroid and to write that out in math we assign it to cluster J, where uh, J is arg min of, or I guess J star, where is the arg min of this function here. Uh, yeah, basically the closest, uh, the closest of these centroids. Now you might be wondering why do we have just the L2 norm versus the L2 norm squared? Uh, it turns out if you're just like looking at distances, then the distance is sort of equivalent to the squared distance if you're just trying to find the closest one. So it doesn't really matter if we have the two here or not. And then we just repeat until convergence. So, okay, let's try to discuss this a little bit. Uh, you can see the two main steps. And it's really kind of uh, natural. The idea is that uh, the first thing you do is you uh, hold cluster memberships fixed. Like pretend you know uh, where you, you hold some cluster part uh, some partition of the points into different clusters. And from that, you compute some parameters. Uh, so you compute some centers, some centroids. And then based on the values of the centroids, then you assign each point to uh, clusters based on that. So you can see they're kind of going back and forth between it finding the centroids, then you find the clusters, and you find the centroids, and you find the clusters. And I have a picture on hand which will perhaps illustrate how this uh, works. Go to the next page. Uh, here is a picture. This is from Introduction to Statistical Learning, one of the textbooks. And let's try to uh, illustrate what exactly is going on here. So you can see initially we start with some uh, data set. The first step in our algorithm is we simply assign points to, uh, to uh, clusters randomly. Like we can initialize many different ways, but let's say we just uh, initialize randomly. So each point is uniformly selected to be either orange, green, or pink. Now let's take a look at the next step of the algorithm. So that's, that's the initialization we just looked at. But the next thing is for each cluster, compute the centroid, that is the sort of center of mass for the points in that cluster. And you can see that, well, we assign things randomly, as you'd expect, they're kind of all near the center. That said, they're all slightly, uh, they're, they're all slightly leaning a bit more in one direction than the other. And in fact, if you take a look at the next step, the next step, is basically uh, to assign each point to the cluster with the nearest centroid. So in other words, we take a look at all the points which are closest to this orange uh, centroid right here, and we assign that to the orange uh, cent uh, the orange cluster. So you can see all these points are just kind of have that as the closest one. So that's why they're colored orange, all the points closer to this. And then similarly, all the ones which are closest to the pink one, these are the ones at the bottom left, they're all assigned to the pink cluster. And finally, uh, all the things which are closest to this green one, then they're assigned to this green cluster. So good. Now we found uh, new clusters for each of them, for each point. And now we go back to the previous step, the kind of uh, this step right here, where we compute centroids again. So you can see that now, given these new cluster identities, then we uh, find the centroids of each cluster. So you can see that. Uh, the center of mass of these green points is found to be here, pink points that seem to be here, and orange points that seem to be here. And you can notice in this simple data set, after just two iterations, you'll notice that this is already a pretty good clustering that we've got right here. 
uh, it's mostly converged. It's not fully converged. If you keep running it for a few more steps, you'll see that eventually it looks maybe something more like this. Uh, see these points over here, perhaps these belong more to the green one. And then this all this is kind of what it looks like in the end. So you can see from a totally unstructured uh, data set, something which we don't really have any idea about, we somehow found three uh, a three means solution, which looks pretty good. It's a pretty decent clustering of the uh, data set. Right. Um, so hopefully that makes sense in terms of how we run this algorithm. Uh, so that's a great algorithm. What, what goes wrong? What's not good about this algorithm? Let me tell you about that. Uh, so what are the drawbacks? And there's a couple drawbacks. Uh, one is that uh, it can be slow to converge. Um, yeah, maybe it gets stuck and has to make a lot of steps before it gets to something which is good. Another drawback is that uh, it, it, what this algorithm does is, like I said, it, you run until convergence, but uh, it'll only be a local optimum. Like I said, so before, up until this point in the, okay, not up until this point in the class, um, for m most of the first part of this class, we dealt with convex functions, say things like uh, least squares, uh, linear regression, and uh, say like, uh, yeah, logistic regression, all these things are convex problems, in which case all local optimum are also uh, global optima. However, since it's a non-convex problem, similar with some of the neural network stuff that we talked about, um, all the neural network stuff we talked about really, these are non-convex problems and therefore the local optimum which it arrives at could be different from the global optimum. And therefore uh, we could actually be quite distant from it. So k-means is actually a reasonably challenging problem in the sense that it's NP-hard to find uh, the exact solution to the k-means problem. That is, finding the uh, cluster assignment which really minimizes this, uh, these, uh, the, the objective function, the loss function that we talked about. And it's even NP-hard to approximate this up to certain constant factors. So, yeah, a real challenge is the fact that uh, the Lloyd's algorithm might not find a, a great solution. And it might be slow even to get to this solution. So there's a few uh, ways to get around these. So one solution, which kind of helps with the latter local optimum rather than, it doesn't really help with slow convergence. It'll take even more time, in fact. But, uh, but basically just repeat algorithm many times. And what do I mean by that? So like, as I said, we kind of uh, looked at uh, the problem where we just uh, randomly initialize it. So what you can do is essentially try a lot of different random initializations, and then you take the best solution. So for example, you can see here, here are six different runs. This is another figure, of course, from ISL. Um, you can see here that uh, this we just basically uh, randomly initialized the problem and then solved it until convergence. And you can see that uh, essentially these four, this one, this one, this one, and this one, they all get the pretty much exact same solution. Uh, I think, yeah, these are all the exact same. You know, there's a difference in terms of which one is the green cluster and which one is the pink cluster and which one the orange cluster, but we can't really ever hope to get that perfectly because nobody told us which one's supposed to be which color. So up to a permutation, these are all the same solution, really. So that's, uh, so these are the sort of best solution we can get, but you can see that if you got unlucky or uh, in, under some other initializations, you can see that this one here has a much higher loss function, so it's not the optimum. And in particular, if you just eyeball it, you'll see that maybe this feels like a worse, worse clustering solution. And similarly for this bottom right one, which also seems like, hmm, this is not really the best thing we could hope for. Even more broadly, you might think that actually maybe based on this data, a k equals 2 solution might be better. But it's, it's kind of hard to judge between k equals 2 and 3 here, to be honest. Uh, but anyway, yeah. Uh, you can see here that if you just run it many times, then even if you get bad answers sometimes, then hopefully uh, you'll get something which, which has a lower uh, loss value. And you only need to hit it once because you can always take the best solution you get when running it many times. So that's one thing you can do. Another solution is to do better initialization.
And for example, one common way to do this is something known as, say, k means plus plus. And the idea here is just instead of choosing randomly on how to initialize points, instead choose in some sort of intelligent way. Uh, I'm not gonna, I don't, I don't know that k means plus plus off the top of my head, but it's something like you start by using some heuristic in the sense that maybe you start with one point over here, you pick maybe at random, and then the next point you choose to be as far away from it as possible, and then the next point is chosen to be as far away as uh, the, both of the other ones. It's a little bit more complicated than that, I think, but yeah, you can see that intuitively at least, if you pick points which are all mutually far away from each other, that might be a good starting place because uh, that would work at least well for this data set. So yeah, and it turns out that with this better type of initialization, you can get uh, things which generally converge faster and have, uh, they will still potentially get stuck in local optima, but they're at least going to be uh, within some certain factor of the um, global optimum. So yeah, that's about it for k-means. It's a fairly simple algorithm and kind of intuitive in my mind, uh, really just, it, just to, if I could summarize it as quick as possible, it's really just saying, you alternate two steps, one where you compute the, uh, hold the clusters fixed and compute the new means, and then keep the means fixed and compute the new clusters. So you just alternate between those two and then eventually convert us to the right answer. In the next part, we're going to talk about mixture models and generative models. And in particular, we'll solve mixture models using an EM algorithm, uh, the expectation maximization algorithm, uh, where uh, it's basically, it's basically a fancier version of this exact same algorithm.